Hello class, welcome to the final lecture of our course. In this lecture we'll be talking about electric current. Uh, we start off with, with current itself and what it is. Uh, current is the continuous flow of electrical charge. Uh, so anytime we have electrical charge, whether it be positive or negative, moving, uh, we call that current. And we'll talk about what the, um, well, I can discuss the units of current right now. So current, as I said, the continuous flow of electrical charge. And so if we would uh, measure the amount of charge, that would be in units of coulombs. And we want to know how much charge is moving through per unit time. And so it's coulombs per second is the units of charge. And we call one coulomb per second, that's one ampere, or amp for short. Uh, and we abbreviate amps with A, one amp. Uh, okay, so amperes or amps are the unit of current that we uh, use in electrical circuits. And so one ampere is one coulomb per second. Remember, a coulomb is a lot of charge. All right, so usually amps are, is a, if we look at the amperage of a, of a uh, circuit, it's usually not a really large number because cool, one coulomb charge is a lot of charge. Now, if we're going to have current, or which is the flow of charge, something has to be driving, right? Because uh, charge particles, uh, charged particles like electrons, they have mass. And if they have mass, they have inertia. And so we have to overcome that inertia. And we talked in our last lecture of uh, electricity that charges exert forces on each other, the electric force. And the uh, charges set up these things called electric fields, which are a type of force field. And that electric field is equal to the force per unit charge that whatever is setting up the field would exert on. Uh, so if we want to have current, we need to something to push or add energy to the charges, namely the electrons, to move them through whatever the current is moving through. And that's where batteries come in. Batteries are where we store electric potential energy, or electric potential. And if we remember, uh, we talked about electric potential, which is joules per coulomb, right? How many joules of energy can be imparted per coulomb charge? Uh, that's electric potential. And we define one joule per coulomb as one volt, okay? And so we measure uh, the electric potential of batteries in volts. So we have like the little like uh, AA batteries that we use for like 1.5 volts. Then you have, you have like three volts, uh, nine volt, 12 volt batteries. And so batteries are different voltage. And what that means, the voltage of a battery is how many joules of energy that battery can impart per coulomb of charge. So a 12 volt battery could give one coulomb of charge 12 joules of energy, okay, to move charge through uh, some closed path. And a closed path of electrical charge is what we call an electric circuit. And so if we have a closed path and we put some sort of potential in there, a battery, the result will be the flow of electric current. And so the symbol we generally use for a, a, a battery and a current are these lines, this being what's called the positive terminal and this being the negative terminal. And we have to connect with some sort of conducting material, usually metal, like copper, the positive end and the negative end, or the terminals of 
the battery. And the voltage across this battery it provides energy that drives charge. Now the convention is, is that the current goes from positive to negative. But I want to make clear that's the convention, but what's actually happening is negative charge. Uh, it's the electrons that are actually moving in the current. So electrons moving this way, being pushed away from the negative terminal towards the positive terminal, can be viewed alternatively as positive charge moving away from the positive terminal into the negative terminal. So even though electric current is actually the flow or of negative charge, the motion of electrons, you could think if electrons move from here to here, this is becoming less negative and this is becoming more negative. Conversely, this is becoming uh, more positive and this is becoming less positive. And so you can view it as positive charge flowing in the opposite direction. So the convention of current is from positive to negative. That's what uh, we conventionally use. But in reality, what's actually happening is electrons are moving from the negative to the positive charge. All right, so if we connect the two ends of the battery, the positive and negative terminals of the battery, current will flow through this closed loop, which we call a circuit. Now, um, current will flow very easily through this if it's, if it's a conducting, if it's a conducting uh, material like a copper wire. And what happens is as in order to accelerate and move these charges, it takes energy. And so this battery will push charge through the circuit until it's store of energy, its electric potential, remember joules per coulomb, is exhausted, right? And so the current will remain constant through a given circuit uh, up until its uh, very end of the battery's charge. And then the current will slow down and eventually stop. It's not like the current um, you know, varies with speed throughout different stages of the battery life. The current is constant, and then it just drops off right before the battery dies. Um, and then it, the current will no longer exist once the, there's no more potential in the battery. All right, so an electric circuit is basically you have something to push the charge. That's some source of energy or electric potential. That's a battery. And then you have an electrically conductive material to allow the, the current to flow through, and that creates a circuit. Okay. Now, uh, the electrons, they move through the conducting material, but the electrons, they bump into other particles, like other atoms, other electrons, and so that bumping into other materials creates resistance. Right? Just imagine if you try to push Say, um, if you're trying to push anything through, uh, I guess a, a, the good analogy, a good analogy is water, right? If you think of current as water, where the battery is a pump, right? If you want to pump water through some plumbing, there's some resistance. And the resistance in the plumbing is largely a factor of how big the plumbing is, how large the pipes are. Right? If there are tiny pipes, then that resists how much water you can put through those pipes per second. Right? Bigger pipes, larger diameter pipes means there's less resistance. You can push more water per second through those pipes. And so this, it's very similar to electric current, where if you have a very narrow, narrow or, or very uh, small diameter wire, there's going to be more resistance than if you have a larger diameter wire. There's going to be less resistance to the flow. So resistance uh, is basically a result of the electrons that move in charge interacting with the pathway. Okay, uh, so the pathway has some resistance to the flow of charge. The electrons they bump into atoms and other electrons, and whenever these electrons are being pushed through the conducting material, bump into atoms, 
and so forth, those, those collisions impart the energy that the battery is giving the electrons into the atoms, and they start moving faster. And as we talk, uh, when we talk about thermal energy, whenever the atoms of the material start moving faster, that's increasing the internal energy of the material, and that's adding heat. It's getting that's that's in the form of heat, and so it'll warm up. So whenever a material has an electrical resistance and you try to push electricity through it, what happens is it gets warm, and that's how. Uh, you, you see like a toaster or an electrical stove top or oven range. When you turn it on, electrical current is pushed through the electrical conducting material and the resistance of that material causes some of the energy that the battery is giving to the electrons that move through is being converted through the resistance into thermal energy, heat. And in the case of um, of metals, once metals get warm enough, they start to radiate not just infrared light, which is the heat you can feel, but they start to radiate invisible light. And so that's why heating elements will often turn red. Or like a, like a light bulb that has a filament, electricity is sent through that little tiny narrow filament and it gets so hot that it glows and it gives off, um, you know, gives off light. And so it's the resistance in the filament of the light bulb that increasing the temperature of that piece, of little tiny piece of metal that causes the radiate visible light. And so resistance dissipates the energy, right? That is being put, imparted into the electrons by the battery. And so if there's very little resistance in the circuit, the electrons can just move very quickly and quickly uh, deplete the battery of its stored energy voltage. Um, and uh, we call that a short circuit. If, if, a, if a circuit is shorted, that means there is a path with very little resistance in that circuit. And as we'll learn, electricity uh, takes the path of least resistance. And so if there is a path within a circuit that has very little resistance, the electricity, almost all electricity, all the current will flow through that path and the battery will run, will be, um, will, 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 will be exhausted uh, very quick. And if a circuit gets shorted, and it's a short circuit, that means very little current runs through the rest of the circuit and, and all those components don't work because all the current is going through the, the, the short part, the shorted part. So that's what happens if uh, something gets short circuited, it doesn't work because all the current is uh, flowing through a particular path, and often what happens is there's so much current that uh, it can't handle it, and um, the, the usually there's a breaker or something that uh, gets it's a circuit breaker that gets tripped. And so a circuit breaker um, is usually has like a piece of little tiny piece of metal that gets hot enough and on the current it breaks and, and it breaks the circuit. So that's electrical, uh, so, so we talk about current, batteries, electric circuit, we talk about resistance. Now the resistance is measured in ohms, okay? And we use the capital Greek letter omega to represent ohms. So ohms is the measure of resistance, all right? So we have the voltage across the battery, V, which produces a current, I. So I is the symbol we use to represent current. And that flows through the circuit. Now, and there's some resistance in the circuit, which we'll call R. So we have these three components to a circle, to a circuit, these three attributes. The voltage, that's the potential, that's the stored energy that pushes the current through the circuit. The current, which is the amount of flow in the circuit, and the resistance, R, which is the resistance to the flow. So the voltage is kind of competing against the re resistance, right? And the amount of current that results depends on the amount of voltage, the, the energy that's pushing 
to come through and the resistance of what's holding back the flow of current. And so the relationship between V, I, and R is that the voltage divided by the resistance in the circuit is equal to the current. And this is known as Ohm's law. It's also very commonly written as V equals I, R. So the voltage of a circuit is equal to the current in that circuit times the resistance in the circuit. All right, so if we know the voltage and we know the resistance, we can calculate the current. Conversely, if we know the voltage and the current, we can calculate the resistance. Or if we know the current and the resistance, we can calculate the voltage. Right. So that is Ohm's law. Now, this circuit here would be a short circuit. The current would just flow because there's very little resistance in just the copper wire. And this battery would run dead very quickly. And so what we typically do in a circuit is we put elements in it. Elements could be like a light bulb or, or some heating element or, or any sort of electrical component that we want the electricity to power. Um, a very simple component is a resistor, which we use a squiggly line. And a resistor is basically we just add a lot of path for the electricity to flow through, so it adds resistance. And so a resistor, what it does is it adds, adds resistance to the flow, and so it reduces the current. So if R increases for a given voltage, if we have a circuit that has a given voltage, if we increase the resistance, we decrease the current. And if the current is decreased, then the battery will last longer. Um, and so an example is a light bulb would have a certain amount of resistance. And so we could put a light bulb in there, and depending on the resistance of that light bulb, the, that would be in the voltage of the battery, that would determine the current. And the more current flowing through the light bulb, the brighter the light bulb would be. And so if, if you think, if, um, if resistance was, was zero, as resistance decreases, becomes very, very small, the current approaches infinity. And that's why the battery just runs dead, and, and the material that, that is moving the current can't handle that much current. Okay, so this is Ohm's law, that voltage equals uh, current times resistance. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have a battery. So this is uh, this is the symbol for a battery. This is the symbol for a resistor. And usually when we do this, this indicates that we have put a, a meter across the battery and are measuring the voltage. But let's just say that this is a, I don't know, a nine volt battery. That's the voltage across this battery. 9 volt battery. And let's say this resistance is, uh, let's say it is 100 ohms, right? It's a pretty large resistor. Um, what is the current in this circuit? Well, we use Ohm's law, V equals I R. We know the voltage. We know the resistance. We can calculate the current, solving for current. 9 volts divided by 100 ohms, that equals 0 0.09 amps. Okay? Now you can see if we decrease the resistance, say this resistor had a resistance of only 10 ohms, then the current would be 9 volts divided by 10 ohms, which equals 0. 9 amps. So we have um, we have 10 times more current because we reduced the resistance by 10. Right? So the less resistance, the larger the current for a given voltage. The more resistance, the less current for a given voltage. Okay. So this is Ohm's law as it applies 
very basically to an electrical circuit. Um, and so if we put a light bulb in there that um, has a certain resistance, the current flowing through it would determine the, how, how bright that light bulb is. Uh, and I also want to say that there has to be a, a closed path for a circuit from the positive to the negative, right? If this is broken in any way, electricity does not flow. Electricity will just remain. If there's a light bulb here, it would not, it will not light. Electricity does not flow. It has to be a closed path. And that's what a switch is. A switch is often indicated by this symbol, where this can be closed to connect the circuit. But once it's broken, once the circuit's broken, electricity stops flowing. That's why if you flip a switch in your house, what you're doing is when you flip it on, you're closing the circuit until electricity begins to flow. Once you flip it off, you're breaking the circuit so electricity stops flowing. Where the voltage in your house is being provided by the power supply, the power lines outside. It's not, a, it's not a, a battery per se, but there's voltage coming into your house. And whenever you, and your house is wired, so there's a bunch of circuits in your house. Um, and uh, whenever you flip the switch, the current flows through the circuits. So now we're going to get Kirchhoff's junction rule, okay? So Kirchhoff's junction rule is that if we have a multiple paths, multiple paths in the circuit that electricity can take. Let's say here we have a branch two resistors in R1 and R2. Now the current flowing in the circuit that comes into these different this junction has to be equal to the current coming out of the junction. That's Kirchhoff's junction rule. And that comes from the conservation of charge, right? We can't have more charge coming in than it's coming out, or we can't have less charge coming amount of charge coming in has to equal the amount of charge coming out. So if we call this I1, the charge flowing through this branch, and this I2, sorry, the current flowing through this branch, and this is the current flowing through this branch, and just I is the current in the entire circuit, then the current in the circuit equals the sum of I1 plus I2. The charge going through this branch plus the charge going through this branch has to equal the charge coming in the charge coming out. That's Kirchhoff's junction rule, that the same amount of charge coming in has to equal the same amount of charge coming out. And we'll apply Kirchhoff's junction rule uh, later whenever we do some circuit analysis looking at elements in series and parallel. Kirchhoff's loop rule tells us that the potential draw across each element in the circuit, which is the amount of energy that takes to push electricity or current through that element, um, has to equal the total energy that's driving the circuit, which is uh, the total potential energy driving the circuit. So let's say we have a resistor, R. Well, if this is nine volts of energy, right, and 9 volts of potential energy in this battery, then the amount of potential energy that's pushing current through this resistor is also 9 volts. 
So nine volts of potential energy are pushing electricity through that uh, resistor. That's assuming that the resistance at the uh, the rest of the circuit is essentially zero. The only resistance in the circuit is the resistor. Where if we had, say, two resistors, like this, R1 and R2, then there would be a voltage drop of V1 across this resistor, and a voltage drop of V2 across this resistor. And if we call this, the voltage drop of nine volts across this battery V, then V equals V1 plus V2. The amount of energy, potential energy pushing electricity through this resistor, plus the amount of potential energy pushing electricity through that resistor has to equal the total potential energy driving the circuit. That's Kirchhoff's loophole. That as we go around the loop, the potential drop across each component of the circuit has to equal the total electric potential that's driving the circuit. That's Kirchhoff's loophole. Okay, so if these resistors are the same, then V1 and V2 will be the same. They're the same resistance. Okay, if they're different, then V1 and V2 will be different. So now that we have this up here, R1 and R2 being one after another along the same path, they're said to be wired in series. So in a circuit, if you have a path of current, and if you have an element, say whatever it is, some circuit element, E1, and some circuit element, E2, that are along the same path, those are said to be wired in series. In series, one comes after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. All right, that's in series. Where circuit elements in parallel, let's say you have a path that electricity is flowing, and you have one branch, this is element one, then you have another branch, this is element two. So the electricity flows, and it flows through E1 and E2 simultaneously, and it comes out. These two elements are said to be wired in parallel. So these resistors are wired in series. Where if I would draw a similar circuit, this is R1, R2. Uh, these resistors are wired in parallel. Okay, and that makes a difference. Okay, because in parallel, whenever you have elements in parallel, the potential drop across each is the same. So the potential drop across both of these would be V, the potential drop across the battery. Where here we have V1 and V2. Now we can. Uh, we can use Ohm's law to kind of analyze a circuit and determine how much current is flowing through each component of, of, the, uh, of the circuit. So let's, let's say here R1 is equal to, um, let's say it's 20, let's say it's 20 ohms. So we have a 9 volt battery and R1 is 20 ohms. And R2 is 30 ohms. I'm going to erase this for right now. Okay. So the current flowing through R1 and R2 has to be the same because they're in series, right? The same amount of current flowing through this one has to be the same amount of current flowing through that one. And since V equals I R, the potential drop across resistance one, V1 equals I R1. So the potential drop across this resistance, resistor, time uh, equals the current through that resistor times the resistance of that resistor. And V2 equals I 
times R2. This is the same current flowing through this resistor. And Kirchhoff's loop rule tells us that V equals V1 plus V2, the potential draw across each of those, each of those uh, resistors. And if we plug these terms in for V1 and V2, you see V equals I R1 plus I R2. We can factor out that I. We see V equals I R1 plus R2. And so you can see for the entire circuit, the voltage of the battery, the voltage drop across the entire circuit is equal to the current in the circuit times the combined resistance of R1 and R2. So this tells us that if we have resistors in parallel, I'm sorry, in series, the equivalent resistance of resistors in series is equal to the sum of the resistance of the resistors. So if we had three, four, five, six, seven resistors in series, to find the equivalent resistance, we just add up the resistance of each resistor. And so the equivalent resistance of these resistors in series is 20 ohms plus 30 ohms, which is 50 ohms. And so because now we have the equivalent resistors, we can almost imagine this as a circuit with a 9 volt battery with one resistor that's has a resistance of 50 ohms. So this circuit would behave the same as this circuit, have the same current. If we calculate that current, uh, current equals uh, V over R. In this case, it's 9 volts over the equivalent resistance. It's 50 ohms. And so we find that this circuit has a current of 0.18 amps. And so that's the current flowing through the circuit. And because now that we know the current, we can actually calculate the potential drop across each, each resistor. We go 0 0.18 amps times R1 is 20 ohms. 0 0.18 amps times 30 ohms. And we find those uh, to be 3.6 volts. And 5.4 volts, respectively. And you'll see that V1, 3.6 volts, plus V2, 5.4 volts, equals 9 volts, right? So there's a potential drop of 3.6 volts over this resistor and 5.4 volts over this resistor, which makes sense that the potential drop across R2 is greater than that across R1 because there's more resistance here. So if you move the same amount of current through more resistance, you need more potential energy, a larger potential drop. And so there's taking 5.4 joules per cool charge to move through this resistor, and it's taking 3.6 joules per coulomb charge to move the electricity through that resistor at this at the rate of the of the current of 0.18 amps or coulombs per second. Okay. Where let's look at the same two resistors. Let's wire them differently. Let's say we have the same nine volt battery the same nine volt battery, but now R1 and R2 are connected in parallel. 
So Kirchhoff's loop rule tells us that you know there's some current in this circuit. The current coming in equals the current coming out. And let's say and the current splits. Some current goes through here, this is I1, and some current goes through here, this is I2. And we know that I, the total current, has to equal I1 plus I2. So the current going through this resistor, R1, plus the current going through this resistor, R2, has to equal the total current moving through the circuit. Now, we know that current, per Ohm's law, uh, v equals IR, we know current equals V over R. And the potential drop across um, components in parallel, we said, is, is the same. So R1, V over R1, and voltage over R2 are the same. And because they're the only components in the circuit, this voltage has to be the same as that voltage. So we can write this as V1 over R1 plus V2 over R2. But the voltage drop across R1 and the voltage drop, uh, drop across R2 are the same for V. So it can be written as So you see V equals I equals V over R. So this term here is equal to 1 over R equivalent in in parallel. So to find the equivalent resistance of resistors in parallel, well, I can write it this way. It's 1 over. And so on. 1 over R3, 1 over R4, whatever. All. Depends on how many are in parallel. You can have another branch, another branch, another branch. You have multiple resistors in parallel. And so to find the equivalent resistance, you take this and divide it by 1 divided. Okay? So for this circuit, the equivalent resistance for them for these uh, resistors in parallel is equal to one divided by one over twenty ohms because they're the same resistance as in that case. R one is twenty ohms. R two is thirty ohms. Plus one over thirty ohms. Then we can find out. Uh, uh, we calculate that. <coughs> It comes out to be 12 ohms. So we can redraw this circuit. Um, as if there's one resistor that has a resistance of 12 ohms. So this circuit has a smaller overall resistance in it. It has the same two resistors in the circuit. The difference is the resistors are wired in series in this circuit and they're wired in parallel in this circuit. Why is there less resistance? Because, well, there's less current that's being pushed through each resistor. Only I1, which is a fraction, which is a portion of I, is being pushed through R1. And only I2, which is a, por a portion of I, is being pushed through R2. Now, more of the current is going to flow through R1 because it has the, least, has the less resistance. So where all of the current had to flow through R1 and all of the current had to flow through R2, and they're in series, only a portion of the current has to flow through R1 and a portion of the current has to flow through R2. And because R1 has less resistance, more current will flow through R1. 
And we'll find out how much current is flowing through each of these resistors. First of all, let's find out how much current is flowing through the total circuit itself. So, what is I? Well, we have V. We have the equivalent resistance of the circuit R. And so I is equal to the voltage V over the equivalent resistance. So it's 9 volts over 12 ohms. And that gives us a current of 0 0.758 amps. And so you'll see that there is more current flowing through this circuit than this circuit, right? Because there's less resistance in this circuit. So for a given potential, 9 volts, more current flows through the circuit with less resistance. All right, so if we would put, put set up these two circuits, which battery will run dead first? This battery, because more current is flowing through it. There's less resistance, and so there's more current. So this battery will run out of charge before this battery. This battery will run longer. So uh, now if you want to calculate the amount of current flowing through each resistor, I1 and I2, um, we, so we can find I1 equals V over R1, which equals 9 volts over 20 ohms. And 9 volts divided by uh, 20 ohms is 0 0.54. Amps, sorry, zero, 0 0.45. And I2 is V over R2, which is 9 volts over 30 ohms, and that equals 0 0.3 amps. And you can't see that I2, 0 0.3 amps, plus I1, 0 0.4 amps, equals total current 0.75 amps. And as I said, because R1 has the smaller resistance, I1 is larger than I2. There's more current flowing through R1 than, R, uh, than R2. Now, if these resistors were, say, light bulbs with different resistance, which light bulbs would glow, glow the, the brightest? Well, uh, there's a saying, the more flow, the more glow. So the more current, the brighter the light bulb. So in this case, these two bulbs would be, uh, oh, I guess they, they're in different resistance. But if we would have this R1 is one light bulb and R2 is another light bulb, uh, would these light bulbs here, light bulb one and two, be brighter or dimmer or the same than these two light bulbs that are wired parallel. Well, R1 here has 0 0.18 amps flowing through it, where R1 here has 0 0.45 amps. So this light bulb will be much brighter, right? Because it has much more current flowing through it. And this light bulb will be much brighter too because it has more current flowing through it. Uh, and so, interestingly, if you wire the light bulbs in series, not only do they glow brighter because there's more current flowing through them. Oh, sorry, they, 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 will, they will glow brighter because there's more current flowing through them, but they will not be lit for as long because there is more current. Uh, the battery will run dead and the light bulbs will go out. Here, the light bulbs will glow not as bright because there's less current flowing through them, but they'll last longer. So how do we create, like say, 9 volts? We can have a 9 volt battery, or with batteries, you can wire batteries in series too. And if you put a Say we have um, a 1.5 volt battery 
and then we wire that with another 1.5 volt battery. Oh. Then this gives us the equivalent. That's why sometimes you draw it like this on the letters. This is a battery that has an equivalent voltage of 3 volts. Right? Or if we put four 1.5 volt batteries in series, that could be represented as one battery with, with an equivalent voltage of 6 volts. All right? Or if we had six 1.5 volt batteries in series, that would be the same as a 9 volt battery. Whenever you wire batteries in parallel, the voltage doesn't add. The voltage remains the same. Right? And so, but what happens is there's a larger energy reserve providing the same voltage. Where here, each battery is giving everything it has, and so they, the voltage adds up. There's more potential in the circuit. series, that's the same as a 6-volt battery. And so these three, these two 3-volt batteries will provide the circuit with 6 volts of electric potential. And so and, and the circuit electricity will flow until the 6 volts runs out. But it will get a larger current for a given resistance. Where if you take these same two 3-volt batteries and wire them in parallel, then the overall voltage is still 3 volts, right? And so you'll get a smaller current for a given resistance. But what happens is you have more capacity, you have actually a larger store of energy. You have uh, it will last longer than a single three volt battery. This will run. This will power the circuit for twice as long as a single three volt battery because you have twice the capacitance of charge. So it's the same voltage but twice the capacitance. So let's say that you're at a remote location and you need batteries to power. Uh, the electronics of whatever you're operating. Well, it, say if you need, say, three volts to power that circuit, then you would take multiple three volt batteries and wire them in parallel so that you get the required voltage to run the circuit. But because you have, say, let's say, uh, six, six three volt batteries wired in parallel, that will run that circuit six times larger than one three volt battery. Um, and so those batteries will, will last much longer. So that circuit will run much longer. Uh, with, and so wiring batteries in, in parallel, kind of just like adding the reserve of energy, but it's still giving the same amount of push. Three volts of push, but you just have more larger depth of potential energy. Where if you put batteries in series, you increase the push. Three volts plus three volts, you're getting six volts of push, but they run out at the same time. They, they'll run out faster. So wiring batteries in series increases the voltage. The voltage adds up. Uh, but the, ca the capacity of the batteries pretty much remains the same. Uh, where if you wire batteries in parallel, you, the voltage remains the same, but it's like having twice the amount of stored charge. The batteries will last two, three, four times as, large, uh, as long, depending on how many batteries you have wired. All right, and so one last example. Um, we'll, we'll look at uh, if these we'll look at 
a circuit that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and we'll have the same resistance, and say they're light bulbs, and we'll see which light bulb will glow the brightest. Let's say we have you know, two 1.5 volt batteries wired in series, so it's the equivalent of three volts, right? Now we have three resistors. And they're equal. All three resistors have the same resistance. Let's say it's 20, 20 ohms. Okay? What is the current that will run through the circuit? What is the current that will run through each resistor? And therefore, if, once you know how much which, if these if these are if these are uh, light bulbs, the amount of current tells us how bright. The brighter the more current, the brighter. So which of these light bulbs will be the brightest? R1, R2, R3. Well, to find out the total current in the circuit, we've got to find the equivalent resistance that these three resistors provide. So these two resistors in parallel, we can re redraw this as the equivalent resistance of these two in parallel. And then there's R3. And once we find the equivalent resistance of these two in parallel, we can find the equivalent resistance of these two in series. Right? And that will just be like the equivalent resistor of those two in series, and that will give us the overall equivalent resistance of these three resistors. Okay, so first let's find the, what the equivalent resistance is of these two resistors in series, so uh, in parallel. So R3 has the same as R1 and R2, so it's 20 ohms. So this equivalent resistance, now remember for in series, we just add them together. So it's 10 ohms plus, uh, oh, so, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, plus 20 ohms. Just so to make sure you're following, this was the equivalent resistance of the two in parallel, plus R3 gives us 30 ohms. So these three resistors, R1, R2 in parallel, and then R3 in series, can be represented by one resistor with an equivalent resistance of 30 ohms. So I equals V over R, and so we have three volts divided by 30 ohms, we get 0 0.1 amps. So 0 0.1 amps is the current that's flowing through, through this circuit. And so Kirchhoff's junction rule tells us that that 0 0.1 amps gets split between R1 and R2. Because R1 and R2 are the same resistance, neither path has less resistance. And so it's going to be the same. It's going to be split equally. So I1 here is going to be uh, 0 0.05 amps. It's going to be half of that. And R2 
two, um, I2 is going to be 0 0.05 amps. It's going to be split evenly. And then the current flowing through R3 is going to be 1 amp. So which light bulb will blow? So the current flowing through this is 0 0.1 amp. This light bulb will blow the brightest. And these two light bulbs, because they have the same amount of current, will blow, will have the equal brightness, but they'll be half as bright as this bulb. So this light bulb will be twice as bright as these two, and these two will have equal brightness. Okay, because twice the current is flowing through this light bulb as is these two light bulbs. Now what happens if you put all three light bulbs in series? What would they glow like then? How would their brightness compare to these light bulbs? So we have the same 3 volt battery, R1, R2, R3, same resistors. Light bulbs have the same resistance of 20 ohms. So the equivalent resistance of these three in series is equal to R1 plus R2 plus R3, which is 60 ohms, right? Much more resistance, where this circuit only had a total equivalent resistance of 30 ohms. And so the current flowing through this circuit is going to be V over R, which is 3 volts over 60 volts. So it's going to be um, 0 0.05. Oh, thanks. And since uh, Since these are in series, the same amount of current is flowing through all three of them. And so all three of these light bulbs will glow as bright as these two, because they'll have the same amount of current, 0 0.05 amps flowing through them. And all three of these light bulbs will be half as bright as this one. The difference is, is these light bulbs will remain lit for longer than these light bulbs because the total current flowing through this circuit is twice the current flowing through this circuit. So all three of these will be have an equal brightness as these two, but half as bright as this one, but they'll, but they'll be lit for twice as long because there's half the current. So this battery will be able to supply this amount of current uh, for, for twice as long because it's half the current. All right, so we get a trade-off, we get you know, this one will be brighter, and these two will have the same brightness. So this will be an overall more light, it will be brighter, but for half as long. Where this will be half as bright, well, it won't be, it'll be less bright, because we'll have three light bulbs that have the same brightness as these two, but we'll have that light for, for uh, double the length, and it's half the current that's uh, depleting the battery. So uh, that brings us finally to power. So whenever we uh, talk about electricity in the house, we often talk about power, like it's the, it's the power company. And so um, power is joules per second, right? It's energy per ton. And uh, we, as I said, whenever you have power supplied to your house, there's, it's almost like a battery, a big battery is connected to your house, where the incoming wire is the positive terminal and the outcoming wire is the negative terminal, and there's a potential drop across it. Inside your house, it's usually 120 volts. Then there's multiple circuits running through your house. If you close the switch, right, electricity flows through. And so you have a voltage of 120 
volts um, running through your uh, applied to this circuit, the different circuits in your house. Now, different elements hold different amounts of power. So let's say you have a light bulb. So a light bulb usually looks like that's that's the uh, symbol for light bulb. Um, light bulbs have different power ratings, right? You can have a like a 60 watt light bulb, and if you remember, a joule per second is one watt. And so what does this mean? Is that a 60 watt light bulb can uses 60 joules of energy every second. And so as the electricity flows through here, it's dissipating through light and heat 60 joules every second. And so to calculate the amount of energy that this light bulb uses, you take its power rating, 60 watts, and you multiply it by the amount of time that it's on. And that will give you the uh, this is in seconds, this will give you the amount of energy, joules, that that light bulb consumed, uh, that used uh, in, in your visible light and heat that it gave off. And so, uh, how your energy bill, if you ever looked at your power bill, it's kilowatt hours. That's the unit of energy used that you're charged for. So kilowatt is the amount of power that's being supplied to your house. That's how many uh, joules per second are being provided to your house. Then hours is the amount of time that you are using that power. And that is, is energy. So you are charged in units of kilowatt hours. And so the more items you have in here that are drawing power, then the more power you're going to use, the more, so this would be, uh, if you had just one light bulb on, you had it on for one hour, and it was 60 watts, uh, well, 60 watts is one to 0 0.06 kilowatts, and if you had it on for one hour, then you would be charged for 0 0.06 kilowatt hours of energy. So the 60 watt light bulb uses 0 0.06 kilowatt hours of energy every hour. And so if you had this on for say 10 hours, that light bulb would use 0 0.06 kilowatt hours of energy. If you had it on for 100 hours, it would use 6 kilowatt hour of energy. Right, so the more elements you have plugged into the circuit, circuitry of your house that are consuming power, the power rating is how much power that they, is required. Like so, something like a electric heater is gonna use a lot more power than 60 watts. Right, it might be 100 watts, or 120 watts or, or something. And so it's more, it's going to consume more energy per unit of time. And so the more elements you have in the circuitry, and as they draw power, you multiply their power rating by how long they draw that power for, and that gives you the energy that they consume. The potential energy they consume, the electric potential energy they consume, and that's how, uh, and that's what you pay for, the amount of energy that you consume. And so that's electric. So that concludes the lectures for uh, not only lecture 14, but for the course in general. I hope that you found uh, this course to be uh, a positive experience and you have a better understanding of the physics of, uh, of your everyday life around you. Thank you very much.